Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Do you have a prophetic understanding of Messiah's coming? And when I speak about his coming, I'm speaking of his second and final coming. Not speaking of the blessed hope or the rapture, but speaking specifically about when Messiah comes to establish his kingdom, the millennial kingdom. And we need to realize that the prophet spoke quite specifically about that. And we see that when he returns a second time, it will be very different than his first coming. His first coming, he did not come to condemn, but to show forth the love of God and extend to the Jew first and also the Gentile the compassion, the love, the grace, the forgiveness of God. And he did the work to make that grace possible when he died upon that tree and he shed his blood. But now when we're speaking about the second coming, he comes for the purpose of judgment. But here's the good news. There is a wonderful outcome of God's judgment. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 11. The book of Isaiah and chapter 11. Now, we began this chapter last week, and we saw that there was a reference to Messiah as that, that twig that came forth from the stump of Jesse. It was a reaffirmation of God's covenantal promise to King David, and God's prophetic revelation to his people. And that prophetic revelation began with the covenant that God made with Abraham. So all of this God wants to fulfill. But here's an important truth. He will do so, but for that promise to be realized in the full sense, first there must be judgment. And we have seen how this 11th chapter began last week with many references to God's judgment through Messiah at his second coming. And we're going to continue with that today, but we're going to see that there's a wonderful end that comes from God's judgment. His judgment is going to bring about a kingdom of righteousness and justice, one of peace, one that manifests his glory, and because of that, there's going to be a joy, an inexpressible joy that the inhabitants of the kingdom, they will experience. So look with me, as I said, to where we left off last week, Isaiah chapter 11, and we're going to begin in verse 11. We read here, and it shall come about, and here's this phrase. Now, in our study today, we're going to see that this phrase, Be'yom Ha'hu, and even though you may not know Hebrew, hopefully, if you listen frequently, you will be familiar with that term, Be'yom Ha'hu, in that day. And I have shared with you so many times that this expression in that day speaks about judgment day. Specifically, Messiah returning in his wrath to pour out upon the enemies of Israel, those who reject prophetic promise from God, his consuming judgment. So in this verse, we're going to see it three times, this phrase, but in our verse, and it shall come about on that day. 
Notice what God's going to do. We read, Yosif Adonai Shenit Yado. And I read this in Hebrew because I want you to know that I'm paying extremely close attention to the vocabulary, to the grammar in the original language. Yosif means he will again. It speaks about a continuation of something that was, was not, and will be. So the Lord will stretch out his hand again to purchase. Now, this is the word liknot. Liknot means to buy in modern Hebrew, to purchase or to acquire. But it also has an idea of redemption. So God a second time, and this is important because it speaks about a last day action of God to bring redemption to his people. Now, I say this, and I want to emphasize it because I'm in the midst of writing a response to a book that was sent to me. And, and the author of that book, he gives no allowance whatsoever for God to do that. In fact, he interprets much of the last day prophecies to have their fulfillment in Messiah's first coming, not his second. So when he would look at this verse, it would mean nothing to him because it would contradict his preconceived theology. And that's why the author of this book does not choose to interpret the word of God literally or in the simple or straightforward meaning, but rather... What does he do? He uses a hermeneutical approach that is a methodology of interpreting the scripture, which is figurative, which is symbolic, which he spiritualizes things in order to not deal with the clear revelation. We read Adonai. That's literally what it says here. And that term Adonai is derived from the Hebrew word, which means Lord or Master. Speaking of one who's in charge. So the Lord will continue or again a second time to stretch forth his hand for the purpose of redeeming, acquiring or acquiring the remnant of his people. And this remnant of his people are going to be the Jewish people who are alive in the last days. Now, we're speaking about the vast majority of Jewish people who survive Jacob's trouble and who are alive physically in order to see the second coming of Messiah. And that seeing of Messiah is going to bring them to accept the revelation of who Messiah is and understand what he has done as a deliverer. So he's going to acquire, purchase, redeem the remnant of his people. The only way that we can understand his people are the sons of Jacob, the Jewish people, who are left, where? Who remain from Assyria and from Egypt and from Patros, Patros, most scholars believe is a, a portion of uh, Egypt, the northern portion. And then we have the term Kush, from Kush, which is below Egypt. Many people see this as Ethiopia. And then he goes to Elam, which is oftentimes understood as Persia or modern-day Iran, and Shinar. Shinar is the region of Babylon. And from Hamat, which is closer to the northern part of Israel in perhaps uh, modern-day Syria, and then from the Isles of the Sea, which means not just in the geographical area of Israel, but also those Jewish individuals who are far away. So it foreshadows in the same way that other places in the prophets. Prophets such as Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, 
Yoel, almost all the prophets, speak of a time when God was going to gather up a remnant, meaning the Jewish people in the last days. They are a remnant of all the generations of Jewish people. And he's going to gather them up a second time and return them to the land of Israel. Verse 12, we read, Venesa nes lagoi. And he will lift up a ness. A ness, most Bibles maybe translate that as a banner or a pole with a message attached to it. It's also the Hebrew word for miracle. So this is a miraculous message that he's going to convey to the nations, but the emphasis is upon the Jews in the nations. For he says, and I will gather, or literally he will gather, the exiles of Israel and the scattered ones of Judah. And he will gather them from the four corners of the earth. Now, what's important about this prophecy is this. Here again, our, our misguided friend who's the author of, of, of this book, well, he wants to say this has a fulfillment in the Babylonian captivity that came to an end that returned with Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah, those who returned from the Babylonian captivity. But this cannot be the case because notice it says here clearly both Israel and Judah. Israel, that exile of the northern kingdom by Assyria, in Hebrew, Ashur, it has not ended. So the fact that Israel is mentioned and Judah, we're not talking about the Babylonian captivity, but we are talking emphatically about a last day exile, one that began in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem and will come to an Ultimately, it will come to an end with the second coming. Now, we see the foreshadowing of this even in our age. Because beginning, for example, in the, the 19th century, we see the beginning of the return. In different places, at different decades, and in different centuries. The, the 1900s and also the 1800s before that, and now the 20th century. And what's so important about this in the 21st century, what's so important about this is that we read where it says, and he will gather from the four quarters. That's not happened in a major way until our days. And it's going to continue until he returns. Verse 13. Verse 13 says that there's going to be a healing between Israel, which here he's going to call Ephraim, and, and Judah. So there's going to be, as Ezekiel says, this coming together of the two sticks, the northern and the southern, Ephraim and Judah. Notice what he says. And he will remove the jealousy of Ephraim. And the enemies of Judah he will strike. And Ephraim will not be envious anymore of Judah. And Judah, he will not have uh, those who are enemies or not be an enemy with Ephraim. So we see that there's going to be a healing of this relationship between all the 12 tribes. And this, look now at verse 14, we read, and they will fly, meaning they're going to return quickly from the, the shoulder, and this is the, the one place allotment of land from the Philistines of the west, and they're going to come together. And what will they do? Well, we read here that these that are going to return, they are going to, plunder the sons of uh, the east. And Edom and, and Moab, they will stretch forth their hand. And the children of Amnon, 
they are going to be brought to submissiveness, to be caused to obey. So we see that quickly, in the last days, there's going to be judgment upon the, uh, the, uh, the enemies of Israel. That's what it's saying. For the Lord will utterly destroy the, the bay of Egypt. And it's the word Lashon Tang, and it's speaking about that, that Suez area, that gulf. And he will wave his hand, some Bibles say fist, but it's the word for hand, over the river. And he'll do so with, with strength, with power, the power of his spirit. And he will strike the, into seven streams, this river, and he will lead in their sandals or shoes, meaning this that he is going to strike the enemies of Israel. Specifically, we see those different enemies mentioned in order that the people who are in bondage, in exile, in those last days, they cannot return to the land, they will be able to walk back. And, and we're seeing a foreshadowing of this with what? With, with Jewish people returning to the land, walking here, from from Africa so God is at move verse 16 and there will be a a highway now this is word misila it's a a significant pathway or a road for those that remain of his people who re will remain in Assyria just as it was to Israel in the day that, that he went up, meaning the people went up from the land of Egypt. Now, whenever we speak about going up from the land of Egypt, it's a reference to exile. So there's going to be one more time at the very end, another removal of exile, a redemption for Israel. And it's going to be just like in the days of the exodus from Egypt. So all of this is prophecy for the last days. It does not speak about anything having to do with Messiah's first coming. Why? Well, here's the problem. At the end of his first coming, Israel went into exile. So it is impossible to interpret this as our, our misguided author did, and say, no, these things have their fulfillment in Messiah's first coming. They don't. They have their fulfillment in his second coming, when there's going to be a regathering of the Jewish people, not just from Egypt, not just from Assyria, not just from Babylon, but from all the nations where they have been scattered. That's what this text speaks of. Well, let's move into the next chapter chapter 12. Chapter 12 is a short chapter and we'll be able to get through it very quickly. Verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 1. Ve amarta be yom ha hu. Be on that day. A reference of judgment, but realize something. For God's covenant people, and I'm speaking about those who come to faith in a new covenant both the Jew and Gentile. God's judgment that day will bring about glory. It will bring about joy as the text is going to teach us. Verse 1, And you shall say on that day, I will give thanks to the Lord, for he has been angry, for you have been angry with me, but you have returned your anger, and I have been comforted. Now, what's important about this is we see the prophet speaking and making it personal to him as a representative. He has been made the, the personal representative, representative for God's covenant people. And he says, you know, you were angry with me, but your anger has returned, meaning been removed. And you have what? You have comforted me. This word for comfort, it's important because 
it is rooted in the same word that the city, that small village known as Capernaum, the village of comfort, it takes its name. And this word, according to the sages of old, and there's numerous support for this. So many times when this word appears, it comes within a messianic context as this one does as well. Because it's through this comfort that God's people are going to receive that he says, look now to verse 2, behold, God, he says, you are my salvation. I will trust and be not afraid for my strength and my song is Yah. This is an abbreviation of the name, the sacred name, yud heh vav -Hey. So you have become my, my song, Yah. And the Lord, he has become for me for salvation. Now, this speaks about something important because it tells us that God, God himself, obviously through Messiah, the Son of God, has saved his people. Now, why is that so important where it says specifically, you have become my salvation? Because here's the problem. One of a great passage of scripture that we'll come to in, in probably about a year from now, to the book of Isaiah in chapter 59 at the end, it speaks about, Uva Litzion Goel, Le Shavat Pesha Miyakov, which means, and a redeemer from Zion will come, and he will turn away the sin of, of Jacob. Now, here again, when we look at that, all the indicators that surround that verse speaks of a end time fulfillment. But our misguided author, what does he do? Well, he in his book says, no, this has to do with Messiah's first advent, his first coming. And, and the Messiah coming to the Jewish people because he realizes when it says a redeemer will come to Zion or from Zion to Jacob to deal with his sin. He says, that coming of Messiah should not be taken literally, but spiritually, figurative, symbolically, as simply the preaching of the gospel, not a literal second coming of Messiah, but the first coming work of Messiah, which can be proclaimed to the Jewish people. But he totally rejects any last day's fulfillment for that passage. Well, this is, is tragic because what it's based in is that God has rejected his prophetic promises. He's canceled them out. And if God does that, well, might he, if the church isn't faithful, might he cancel out those promises as well? See, it lays a horrible precedent. And furthermore, it's totally unbiblical. So we read, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and be not afraid, for my strength and my song is Yah. For the Lord, he has become for me salvation. Verse 3. And I will draw, literally, and you will draw water with joy from the wells of salvation. And this all testifies to the, the individual responding to this message of salvation. Look now to verse 4. And you shall say, Be'yom ha'hu, the third time it's mentioned, judgment. God's judgment has a wonderful outcome, marvelous results for his people. Verse 4. And you, and it's plural, referring to Israel. And you, on that day, you will give thanks to the Lord, you will proclaim his name, and you will make known among the nations his works. So in that last moment, Israel is going to be used to bring a remnant of the Gentiles. And we see that in Zechariah 14, 
where it clearly speaks about there's going to be a remnant, a small number of those that went up to Jerusalem for war, but when they see God's faithfulness to Israel, they are going to, to come to salvation. So it's only when we look at all prophecy and, and understand it, interpret it literally, the simple meaning, allowing the text to speak to us not to bring a, a, a figurative, or a symbolic, or a desire to spiritualize the text, or to say something that is so misleading, that it's through the lens of Christ, the faith of Christ that we rightly understand. Certainly, but that does not mean that we change the, the message of the text. No, Messiah gives us the ability to understand the simple meaning of the text. So we read verse 4 once more. And you, plural, shall say on that day, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name or proclaim in his name, make known among the peoples his works, and make mention, make mention that his name is exalted. And the word for make mention is the Hebrew word haskiru. And it comes from the word that, that means to remember. Here it's in the hif'il, which means to cause to be remembered. So we would say make mention. But this word always has a covenant context. So all of this speaks about making known God's faithfulness by means of his covenant, that he's true to his covenant. And by doing so, his name, his character, his reputation is going to be nisgav, lifted up, exalted. Verse 5, saying to the Lord, for majestically he has done. Make this known in all the land. And then finally, our last verse, verse 6. Be joyful and shout. Who? The one who dwells in Zion. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Now, do you hear that? The Holy One of Israel. See, our misguided author, instead of emphasizing the term Israel, whenever he can, he speaks about Palestine. A word that is offensive to God. It comes from the Hebrew word palashim which has to do with a rebellious people who worked against the covenant promises of God and wanted to replace the Jewish people in the land, the children of Israel, wanted to defeat them and cast them out. And that's why it is so offensive to use the term Palestine. It does not represent anything that is in faith but it speaks to those historically, biblically, that are against the faith. So we never, God forbid, hear the Holy One of Palestine. That is an oxymoron. That is a falsehood. No, we hear. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. And that's why it is so offensive so misguided. Let me give you an example of what I'm speaking of. Several years ago, I was reading an article in Christianity Today, and they were speaking to two individuals, one a Jewish believer and the other one a Christian pastor by the name of John Piper. And when they were talking about the 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 New Jerusalem, that kingdom of God. John Piper called it the New Palestine. Now, I, I've looked in the book of Revelation. I've seen what it says about that eternal and state, the eternal state of the kingdom of God. It calls it the New Jerusalem because Jerusalem, that word has meaning. It has significance. How dare one would call it the New Palestine. Why is it their tendency to remove biblical terms and put in terms that are politically pleasing to individuals? 
And those individuals who are pleased are normally those who question this book, who want to reinterpret it in ways that go against the prophetic promises of God. See, we need to wake up. We need to be individuals that don't get drawn along by false teaching. People who might look so holy, who might speak so emotionally, but, but they are exactly what Messiah meant when he speaks about being aware of those who come in sheep clothing, when they are really devouring wolves on the inside because they want to devour up the promises of the prophets and replace them with distortions of the texts so that we, we do not have a God who is covenantally faithful. And all of that is to do one thing. It is to place doubt in people's mind. And let me ask you a question. Who is the author of doubt? It's not the Holy Spirit, but it's that serpent. When he said to the woman, did God really say? Creating that doubt rather than the simple understanding of the text. Wise up. Wake up. Be discerning. And the individuals that speak lie, we need to call them out in love, hoping that they will repent and believe in a biblical revelation. Well, I'll close with that until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.